so these are just some uh, random thoughts about how you might approach writing a play uh, from somebody who's very much uh, still learning about that process, uh, which is ongoing, never stops. Um, so when I start a play, I try to work out three essential things, and that's the, the story, the plot, and what I call the game. Now, story is obviously the events in the play that happen in chronological order. And plot is the way that the dramatist arranges those events that is most germane to their purpose. But the game is purely for the audience. It allows them to become imaginative collaborators, I think. And it helps you not only create the experience for them, but also with them. Uh, the game is the fun part. It's the part where you get to play with an audience's expectations and to live in their head rent free for an hour and a half. Uh, and as with any game, there are two essential things you need to know. What are the rules and how do I win? So it's like a code that the audience has to figure out. Now, by the game, I'm not suggesting a ludic quality that is necessarily comedic, although it often is, and it's also deadly serious or can be. Uh, I think of it more as a way of approaching drama that is beyond narrative and returns us to the idea of praxis, which is the Greek word that means both practice and action. It's the doing part, the element of play in any drama. And sometimes the game can occur just in one or two scenes, and sometimes it's the entire play, as is the case in Conor McPherson's play, The Weir, or in Carol Churchill's wonderful play, A Number, for example. Now, there are many, many examples, and the game itself can take several forms. It can be the moment-to-moment -moment strategizing of characters and their employment of tactics in order to achieve their goal. Or it can be the way a dramatist has arranged the scenes that reveal a hidden pattern to the audience, as in Harold Pinter's reverse chronology play, Betrayal. It could be a rule that the dramatist secretly sets themselves, that the audience then has to figure out, as in Passover, Antoinette Nwande's riff on Waiting for Godot, which transplants the action to a street corner in Chicago and crackles with undertone of racial violence. So it's a, it's a very different play to uh, Godot, but um, it uses Godot as a template, um, as a sort of framing device. So how do we find out the rules if the game itself always changes? Well, by closely watching the actions of the characters, and the gap between what they say and what they do. The discursive possibilities of the novel are given short shrift by a theatre audience in search of drama because its fourth dimension, namely time, demands the immediacy of action. And that's not just physical action, but also the kinetic currency of thought. When information becomes an electrical charge of energy, of emotion, and that transmutes bare words into pure feelings, so then what you're watching on stage is just raw energy. And that's when the words are doing something rather than just saying or describing something. So dialogue needs to be active and propulsive. It can challenge, refute, beguile, charm, misdirect or lie, but it doesn't describe, or at least not in the novelistic sense. So I'm not talking about subtext here, although that does play a part in the game. But the question that underpins a scene in Pinter, for example, isn't what are they saying or even what are they not saying, what are they concealing, but rather what are they doing with what they're saying? That is, what does the dialogue do to the character it's being spoken to in that moment? Is it being weaponized? Is it defending, seducing or attacking? Is it stalking? Is it undermining by stealth or is it placating? So dialogue is strategy, and strategy is game. So you work out the plot and the story first, and then you try to bury it inside the game for the audience to find. I think of this as the audience's reward for buying a ticket and giving you 90 minutes of their precious time. So it creates this kind of triangulation between playwright, actor, and audience, and opens up the imaginative space between the stage and the auditorium. If this sounds prescriptive, it's not meant to be. The urgency and vitality of the form at its best, which I think is fundamentally democratic at its core, has to involve the audience. It should put them in a position where they think, what would I do 
in those circumstances. It's an empathy machine, and theatre is where we go to rehearse catastrophe and apocalypse, joy and confusion, laughter and pain, and to watch the inexhaustible and often incomprehensible wonder of human behaviour. It's a place, I think, of where we go to interrogate who we are. And the great Irish dramatist Tom Murphy once said, and I think this is, um, this is, a, this is a, a great notion, that its main purpose is to simply celebrate being alive in time at the same time. And the idea of the game embraces this notion because it invokes its ritualistic beginnings in 5th century Athens, BCE, uh, and it has endlessly morphed and mutated into new forms and revitalised possibilities over the centuries. And it will continue to do so. Each generation recreates the game in its own image, I believe, absorbing the cultural, political, psychological and civic energies of the culture it emerges from and reflects it back at it. It offers a mirror up to nature, catching us in a sideways glance that shows us not only who we are, more vitally it surprises us with a possibility of who we may become. <laughs>